everyone. I'm Diana. I'm Nick. And we are Team RCIA. Gosh, we're on a roll. It's like three weeks in a row. How about that? <laughs> I don't it's know if we're never going to happen week. again. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's see. What have we been doing? This is this is first season since she watches our vis videos just to hear about what we've been doing. <laughs> Hi, season. Um, what have we been doing? I think we've Not just much. been sheltering in place, eating Not and much. drinking. Nick uh, got a, an air fryer and has been making french I have fries. Been, I've been air frying, <laughs> yes. French fries, meatballs. I did something else. <laughs> yes. So, all good stuff. Yep. But that's something we want to talk about. <clears throat> okay. uh, we, uh, we thought we'd talk about a question that we got recently, which, is, uh, we, which we get kind of frequently, but this one was phrased interestingly. Uh, so I'll just read it to you. Uh, since the catechumens and candidates come into the church at Easter Vigil, how do you handle someone who wants to join RCIA and say March when others in the RCIA process have been there for several months? All right, wait, let's read, let's read that again because the wording is very yeah. important. Since so, the catechumens and candidates come into the church at the Easter Vigil, right. How do you handle someone who wants to join RCIA in March? Yes, when others have been there for several months. So uh, I think it's a really kind of important and key question. It, as I said, it's one we kind of hear versions of all the time. And, uh, and, it's, and there's lots of pieces to it. That's why Diana read it again, because you have to sort of break apart all the little assumptions that are in there embedded in the question there's a lot of things going on there yes and it's it's you you wouldn't necessarily if you just heard that question and be like oh yeah I right. totally get that but it also depending on how you your paradigm about what RCIA is yeah. and does will give you a different lens as to what's going on behind that question and it's it's not that the the question is wrong or anything but we have to no, look at the all. nuances you, exactly it it well it's it. an, i think like i said i think it's an important question mm -hmm. because a lot of us have it and as diana said it it sort of presumes a paradigm it yeah. presumes a, a way of our say and you've heard us say this before so if if your paradigm is that uh, at, that the sacraments are something you're going to get and the way to get them is you go through this course or you go through this process or you go through this program and when you've completed all the steps of that program then you get you get what you were um, hoping for and and that is that is a common paradigm but it is not the paradigm it is not the vision that is uh, that the church has that's embedded in the right itself, mm -hmm. the right of Christian mm -hmm. initiation of adults. Yeah. So, so first of all, well, well, first of all, it, it's important to say that oftentimes seekers will come to us yeah. with this kind they of have, language. They have that paradigm, yes, because that's that's what we have presented them with. Or you, they find it on the internet, yes. or or a friend of theirs, or something like that. And lots and lots of parishes have that paradigm. So this caution is not for them. This caution is for us, the the church leaders, people who are publicly seen as those who represent the church. And a seeker comes to that person and says, how do I blah, 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 blah. We have to be very careful about how we use our language so that they understand what it is they're asking for. Right. right? OK. So, so, so the very first part of the question was, um, since catechumens candidates come into the church at the Easter Vigil. So the first thing we have to note is that the, the catechumens and the candidates are already in the church, right? So they're not waiting for the Easter Vigil to come into the church. The catechumens come into the church when they become catechumens. Mm -hmm. the, the right it says uh, in paragraph 47 that they're joined to the church and are part of the household of Christ at the moment they celebrate the rite of acceptance, at the moment they become catechumens. They're part of an official order of the church, the order of catechumens. So again, that's paragraph 47. So mm -hmm. ritual texts are and our weekly public service announcement. If you are doing RCIA, you need to, must have this ritual text. Um, and 
paragraph numbers are how we refer to the citation. So paragraph 47, and again, that is saying that after a person has celebrated the rite of acceptance, that is for a person who is unbaptized, they celebrate the first public ritual, the rite of acceptance into the order of catechumens, they are official members of the church. Yes. And, and everything, <clears throat> you know, if they're really seekers, if they're seeking something, <clears throat> if they if they want to be part of the mission, part of what we do as Catholics, they can start doing that as soon as they become catechumens. They can start uh, participating in parish life. They 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 come to Sunday Mass. They um, they participate in the in the social mission of the church. Uh, they they have a domestic church at home, so they're they're not they're not fully initiated it they're like novices they're like trainees and they're learning how to do all these things <clears throat> but they can actually start doing them just like the woman at the well as soon as she had that conversation with jesus she starts doing the mission right away when the church experts the disciples weren't mm -hmm. doing the mission they they sort of fell down on the mission at that point it, it's like um engaged or not even engaged couples who are dating yeah Nick was part of my family long before yeah, you, we were engaged right. long, and, and long before we got married and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so we are, our catechumens are members of the church. And so we have to be very careful when we say things like, uh, since catechumens and candidates enter the church or come into the church at the Easter vigil, that's really inaccurate. They entered the church long before yeah. so catechumens and, at the right of acceptance in the baptized candidates obviously are members of the church from the moment of their baptism they're yes. they're in communion with the catholic church the 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 right says that they're not yet in full communion so what they're striving for is full communion just like the catechumens are striving for full initiation but as Diana pointed out in that analogy about dating they're all they're already in relationship with the church they're already members in some way and so we, we, we need to really honor that and not, not talk about them like they're outsiders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next part of that question uh, then, we, we want to, uh, the, the question went on to say, you know, they come in March and they want to join the RCIA. D take a breath. Nobody really wants to join the RCIA, right? So they, 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 uh, they get put into the RCIA, or they become part of the RCIA process for a different goal. And, and what that goal is, we don't really know until we meet them. It could be, there are lots, as you, you know this, there are lots and lots of goals. Some, some might have a goal to become Catholic. Some might have a goal to marry a Catholic. Uh, some might have a goal to unify their family because some of them are Catholic and one of them is not. Um, some might have a goal to, to uh, obtain eternal life. Uh, some might have a goal to be part of a community of believers or a community of disciples. You know, the, the goals vary, and, and, but none of those people are really striving to be part of the RCIA. That's not why they call us up. It's not why they knock on the door. They may say that those words because they saw them on the Internet or a friend of theirs. They may say, they may call you up and say, I want to join the RCIA. But if you talk with them long enough, you realize that's a, a, a means to an end. They don't really have that as a goal. Second part about that uh, <clears throat> part of the question, they join the RCIA, is that <clears throat> that implies then that the RCIA is a discrete, yeah. separate group that happens at a discrete, separate time. Mm -hmm that is different than simply being part of the Christian community. And uh, in, in our way of operating, that is often how we see RCIA. We see, uh, come join the RCIA, come to the RCIA, be part of the RCIA. Or RCIA happens at 7.30 on Wednesdays or something. But again, if we go back to what the church's vision is of the RCIA, it says nothing about RCIA meetings, RCIA groups, it doesn't even mention an RCIA team. What it does mention is the community of Christians mm -hmm. as uh, manifested in the local parish that is where RCIA happens, within the community of Christians. And so we have to ask ourselves, if RCIA happens within the community of Christians, where, where and when does the community of Christians meet? Yes. 
And the answer is all the time, right? Everywhere. So primarily Sunday Mass, but now in pandemia, a lot of us are not even having Sunday Mass. So where else are we meeting right now primarily is in the domestic church, which has gotten a lot of attention lately, but not so much attention before the pandemic. So after the pandemic's over, we want to keep that attention on the, on the domestic church. Uh, when the pandemic's over, Sunday Mass, uh, all of our parish gatherings. Uh, Music ministry, lectors, food, ushers. Food shelter, rosary group. Bible study, uh, um, mission to Tijuana, parish uh, fiesta meeting, parish yeah. council, Guadalupe procession. Um, goodness. So it just school community. So how do you know where where each person goes, and how do you know where to slot all your seekers in this formation group? Well, again, you won't know till you know what their goal is, until you have meetings with them, some discernment process, and 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 a, a sponsor that's really attentive to them and knows what's going on in the parish. And so again, it's like that relationship. When if you're if you're in a, a family with you know multiple brothers and sisters, and let's say most of you are married, none of you went through your engagement process in the same way. There was no one size fits all for for dating and falling in love and getting married in your family. And it's the same with the seekers. We can't do a one size fits all program or, or curriculum for people who want to fall in love with Jesus and become one with Jesus. It's going to be different for every single person. And in in the blog post that uh, I posted in the comments box here, um, Nick mentioned uh, one of the latest teachings from the church, one of the latest documents uh, giving us guidance is the directory for catechesis, which yeah. says... Uh, well, it says that thing that I just said about one size fits all. The need for formation that pays attention to the individual often seems to become blurred mm -hmm. as one size fits all models take hold. And so lots and lots of our parishes, again, have that paradigm where we're where we're, we're doing a class or a program, and so it's a class. You would go buy a curriculum, or we download a curriculum or a program from the internet, and everybody's supposed to fit into that. Or, or we buy a set of videos, and everybody's got to watch the videos in order together as a group. And, and it's, a, again, this one-size-fits-all thing, uh, it, it, it makes us less able to respond to the individual needs of each each seeker that comes to us. Okay, so just to review so far, first off, catechumens are members of the household of God. They are already entered into the church, otherwise they can't be catechumens. And so we have to pay attention to our language about how we talk about catechumens, as well as candidates who are already in communion with the Catholic Church. They are uh, members of the household of God because of their baptism. Now, and second, that nobody joins the RCIA because RCIA is not is not a uh, a group. RCIA is a process for being part of to live out to be trained in the Christian life. And so, what the RCIA facilitates is participation in the Christian life, which happens all the time in all the many ways that we've talked about. And then third, that nobody has the exact same process as anyone else who has gone before them or the process that you might have gone through because the Holy Spirit works in each person in unique ways and we have to honor that. So if if anybody's gonna freak out about any of that, it's gonna be that last point you made. I that, know. that we don't have a standard process for everybody. So then what do we do when we have all these people? Well, the, the right gives us a, a guideline. Again, it doesn't give us a, an absolute you know, curriculum or step by step for every person, <clears throat> but it gives us a guideline, which is in paragraphs four and five of the RCIA. It says the initiation of catechumens is a gradual process. So first of all, we have to under we have to imagine what's gradual for the person in front of us. For you can use dating analogies again in your family. You've got you've got a, a brother who fell in love with his beloved and and they were married within three months. You know that it was like almost instantaneous. And Diane and I were engaged for five years, <laughs> so it's it's going to be different for everybody. But gradual is a, is an individual uh, thing that you're going to discern with the Holy Spirit and the and the seeker and yourself and your team. So so it, but gradual is important. It's not a it's not like a train where everybody gets on at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
second part is that this is a process that takes place within the Christian community, within the community mm. of the faithful. And so we've already talked about where does RCIA happen? Not mm. at your Wednesday 7.30 right. RCIA meeting. RCIA is happening wherever the community of the faithful is doing what the community of the faithful does. Primarily the Sunday gathering, whether that's in person or online or in small groups or in the the Christian home where they pray mealtime prayer together. That is the Christian community. That's where RCIA is happening. And then in all of the other ways that the Christian community is doing the work of Christ as individuals and as a community, that is where RCIA takes place. So our role as RCIA team members is to help catechumens and candidates participate in those multiple varied opportunities of living the Christian life, uh, as you say, in the wild, to see Catholics in the wild, in mm -hmm. their natural habitat, yeah. Yeah. Uh, doing Catholic things. It's like Catholic you go to the things. Catholic zoo and you see the Catholics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so we, we invite catechumens to participate with other Catholics to do what Catholics do, and that is our CIA, right? So, uh, number one, it's gradual process. Two, it happens in community. Third, anytime we, anytime we are in Christian community, domestic church or one-on-one -on -one having coffee with a friend or Sunday mass or uh, soup kitchen or pancake breakfast, anytime we're in Christian community, which is always, we are living for the sake of the other. We're always putting the needs of the other before our own. We're always sacrificing our own comfort our own good uh, for elevating and helping the other especially strangers but even but also friends and loved ones in our community and that self-sacrifice that is that is indicative of a, of a Christian life we call Paschal Mystery now sometimes we use the phrase about Paschal Mystery it's the life death resurrection uh, of Jesus which is true but when we say it like that it sounds historical it sounds like something that happened in the past which it did but it also continues to happen in the life <clears throat> in the life of Christ now which is the life of the Christian community that's where we see the paschal mystery in action so all of this formation of your of the seekers has to be a formation in paschal mystery living mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in the RCIA itself, it says, by joining the catechumens in reflecting on the value of the Paschal Mystery, Number three. that's Paschal Mystery, it goes on, and by renewing their own conversion, conversion. Number the four. faithful provide an example that will help the catechumens to obey the Holy Spirit more generously. Okay, so <clears throat> those two things, the Paschal Mystery by... Uh, joining the catechumens and reflecting on the value of the Paschal Mystery and by renewing their own conversion. The faithful give an example yep. of following the Holy Spirit. So here it, it's really very interesting because it's not the RCIA team's job to teach catechumens and candidates about the Paschal Mystery or about conversion. It's the community of the faithful's right. job. And they do that not by giving a PowerPoint or a lecture or a presentation or a book, or, but it says by their example, the faithful provide an example when they renew their own conversion and reflect on the value of the Paschal Mystery. And so we have to uh, put catechumens and candidates in the same place witnessing how the community of the faithful are renewing their own conversion. How are you and I and the people in our uh, parishes being uh, changed by the Paschal Mystery to be more like Christ? That's what conversion is. It's changing your way of life to align more, um, more visibly to how Christ would act in the world today. And so we have to put um, up, uh, uphold witnesses upholds uh, places where Christians are showing that sign of conversion. So wherever, wherever a Christian is forgiving, wherever a Christian is sacrificing themselves, wherever a Christian is loving those who have been forgotten, that, those are the examples we need to show and to model for our catechumens. 
So number five in this list of ways of, of creating a, a formation process that can be uh, unique and individualized for each seeker. Number five is initiation is suited to a spiritual journey of adults. Now, <clears throat> when you think of very young children, you know, as adults, we say to them, we know what's best. And we, we, we set out a, a life plan for them. We tell them they've got to go to school. They have to brush their teeth. They have to go to bed at a certain time. We've got a bunch of rules. You remember when we, you were a little kid, you had to follow a bunch of rules that, you're, that the adults set up for you. Now, we tend to do the same thing when seekers come to us. We set up a bunch of rules for them that they have to follow sort of with the attitude that we know best. And that's really not adult kind of learning or formation. If you go back to the, to the dating analogy again, um, as, as Diane and I are getting to know each other, as you got, we're getting to know your spouse or as one of your relatives is getting to know their spouse, uh, it, it was a, a dialogue between equals. It was a, it was a growing of a relationship where, where both partners brought gifts to the relationship and the, the joy of, of discovery in knowing and finding out what those gifts are and how they can enhance the relationship and it should look and feel the same way when seekers come to us they're not blank slates that we just kind of open up and pour information into they come already filled with the gifts of the holy spirit and part of our work is to discern where the holy spirit has been leading them and guiding them all this time even if they've never heard the phrase holy spirit or they don't know have, have no clue who jesus christ is Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit has still been guiding them and teaching them and gifting them. And we have to discover what that journey has been so far before we can begin to accompany them on the journey going forward. And, and that is ritualized that in the very first uh, public rite of the RCIA, uh, in the rite of um, acceptance into the order of catechumens, one of the prayers that we pray uh, in thanksgiving to God is that, uh, Lord, you have sought and summoned these children of yours in many ways, and now they have responded. And so that is recognizing that uh, God's grace is operative regardless of our work. God's grace is always communicating God's self to um, all of God's creation. And so our job is to help uh, seekers recognize how God has been calling them, not to say, oh, now God is going to communicate with you. No, God has already been in relationship with them in many ways before they even came into our, our vision, right? Okay, so that's five guidelines so far. We got one more uh, for a total of six. So it's been a, it's going to be a gradual process that takes place in community. Uh, that is uh, a, a conversion journey that is uh, rooted mystery. rooted in the Paschal mystery, uh, and it's a spiritual journey of adults. And the final one, number is six, is that this process varies according to so many things, according to the many forms of God's grace. Again, grace. God's grace has been working in many different ways. We have to acknowledge how those uh, those encounters with God's grace have been different for each person. Many forms of God's grace, the free cooperation of individuals. So, you know, it took a long time to convince Nick to marry me. <laughs> the action of the church and the circumstances of time and place. And so you see, it's not simply because it's March we have to hurry up and get this person ready. Right. There are so many things that we have to take into consideration. So time of year, whenever they show up into your, your vision, into your parish community, it almost doesn't matter because there's so many other things that are taking place right. and uh, time frame is like the least of that. So let's take a look at two examples yeah. of how these six principles might, um, might help us uh, uh, name uh, a process for each individual. So these examples are kind of two extremes um, on different ends of the spectrum. And, and we're going to start with the person who kind of has no Christian background or, or upbringing or training. And let's imagine she showed up in March. So let's say that um, she shows up in March, Sunday mass or, or, or a wedding at your place or a funeral at your place. Somehow she gets connected. Some family member drags her to something going on at church. And, 
and she has a, she's a single mom, she's kind of young, and she has a, a baby. And she wants to get her baby baptized because she knows, like she heard baptism is a good idea or something. Anyway, she doesn't really know, but she thinks it's a good idea, can help her baby. And she talks to your pastor about that. And and after some conversation with her, and maybe, maybe he helps her connect with somebody else in the parish or he continues to meet with her, but in some way or another, the, this conversation goes on and she eventually decides she wants to get baptized also. Now it's March, you know, and the pastor brings this woman to you, to your RCA team, and everybody freaks out because she's, she's going to disrupt everything, you know. She's, and, and, and what we, what I, what I hope none of us listening to the sound of my voice would ever do is to say, well, we just can't do anything with her in March. We have to wait until September when we start again. I know that happens in some places, and we cannot do that. We cannot do that. And sometimes, and I know you don't do it, but I've heard other people say, complain about her. Yeah. Saying, she's, oh, she's wrecking our process. Yeah. I, I can't believe Father brought us this person. Yeah. It's March. What are we going to do? Doesn't she, she was supposed to register. She was yeah. supposed to register for RCIA. Back in, back in August. In August or September. She should just come back in September and we can register her then. Yeah. That has nothing to do with what this is, right. and so let's just stop any kind of thinking or language. It'd be like that. it'd be like when I when I saw you across the distant room, you know, and our eyes locked, and and I worked up the courage to come over and say hello to you, and you said, "I'm not accepting any new dates until September." You yes. Know? <laughs> so, no. I, I, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's apply the, the guidelines then to this woman. If her, if her initiation is going to be a gradual process, we're not going to try to get her ready for this coming Easter vigil and maybe not even the next Easter vigil. You know, it's going to depend again on a lot of things, but, but we're, going to, we're going to use a gradual process based on what we discern with her and the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of that is just getting to know her. Right? Yeah, exactly. To know her story, to know her goals, but, but her not desires. even not even just us getting to know her. The the, the community, community, the community has to get to know her. Yeah. So we're going to start bringing her to community activities. We're going to start getting her invited into parishioner homes for dinner or coffee or something. We're going to start connecting her in lots and lots of ways to the parish. Because as we've we've gotten to know her, we're we're learning that she's never had any kind of. Uh, practice of faith or religion or or any kind of association with with Christians mm -hmm. and what she's asking for baptism for herself and her baby is about living the Christian way of life and so her formation is going to be heavily focused on helping her do what other Christians do and then as she's getting immersed into the Christian community she's going to see examples of sacrifice and paschal mystery she's going to see examples of conversion she's going to be inspired by those examples and she's going to want to try to live that way herself uh, she's going to she's going to feel an obligation to her child to start to raise her child in a way that reflects the values of these wonderful Christian friends that she's now developing in the Christian community. So so Paschal mystery and conversion happens by example, happens by uh, by being in and being uh, witnessed to by the by the parish community, not not by a video that we play for her on the Paschal mystery. And not by a, a timeline of classes or meetings right. that she has to go through. Right. So it's it's this falling in love with Christ through the parish community, right. and no one can predetermine how that happens. And and then we're treating her always like an adult, you know. So we're we're trying to accommodate to her schedule because she's got to work a couple jobs because she's a single mom. Uh, we we're trying to realize that the Holy Spirit has already been gifting her and leading her to this place. We're trying to discern where she is on her faith journey so we can appropriately accompany her. But we're treating her as an equal and as an adult and not as, um, you know, a, a subject that needs to be filled up with data. And, and because RCIA happens in the midst of the community, mm -hmm. she never misses an RCIA session yeah. because community is happening all the time, even online. And so we can uh, honor her needs by saying, well, you know, 
Wednesday night, 730 is not the only time that you have to be anywhere because our Christian community is doing all sorts of things. Right. So let's see what fits with you. And, right. And so that what see, see what fits part is the last guideline that this varies. So we're going to vary it for every person. Okay. So, so let's second. Right. Let's example. imagine our second person. Let's say this is a, a Lutheran guy who's been a parishioner for a long time and he's married to a Catholic and he's got uh, some children and the, his wife and he are raising their children as Catholics and he's he's really just been living a, a, as, a, as a Catholic all these years but so far has not yet felt called or, or ready to, to say I'm going to make a, a full complete be in full communion with the Catholic Church until recently and now he's decided that he wants to do that well, he's already had a gradual process because he's been in the parish for years now. And so he, and, and, and in the same way, he's been immersed in the community. He's been both in his Lutheran community that he came from, where he was a pretty good Lutheran, and in the Catholic community now where he's been f for several years. He's been both witnessing Paschal mystery and conversion, seeing that happen in others, and being a good example of that himself to his wife and his children and the other members of the parish. Mm -hmm. So he's he's got that part down, you know, about, about community and Paschal mystery and conversion. He's he's already doing all that. We can sort of check that off. He's done those mm -hmm. things. He's doing those things. He has some questions, some questions yeah. about like the Pope yeah. or reconciliation or, you know, very kind of nuanced questions about the differences between his Lutheran faith and the Catholic faith. And so we want to attend to those questions and help him uh, embrace the Catholic paradigm and worldview about that. Mm -hmm. So, so there is still formation for him to do, but it's totally different than our first uh, example of the single mother who has right. never had any kind of experience of religion or Christianity or uh, a prayer life. Right. So that that touches on that varies when the last mm -hmm. principle that this varies. So it's going to vary, be very different for. The Lutheran uh, Catholic, the Lutheran parishioner, mm -hmm. it'd be very different than it will be for the unbaptized, unchurched uh, young woman. Um, and and then uh, we we skipped over adult, but it should be pretty obvious. We're going to treat this guy like he's already pretty well gifted and pretty well uh, uh, ready to take this step forward in his life. We're going to trust him and trust in the Holy Spirit. We're going to treat him like somebody who knows what he's doing on the Christian mm -hmm. journey because he's been here for yes. quite a while. So, and, and that, and his process could happen pretty quick in another, another few weeks or maybe a month or two, depending on where he's at, but much faster, of course. It's still a gradual for him because his gradualness has already happened, but his reception into full communion, his celebration of the sacraments would take place much, much, much sooner yeah. than it would for the unchurched woman who's just starting out on this journey. So if he, if he uh, uh, voices his desire to become Catholic to you in March, he could uh, essentially become, become Catholic in March. <laughs> Become Catholic in March or in April. Yeah. Um, ideally, the church says that he would not celebrate the rite of reception at the Easter Vigil. Right, he wouldn't go to the Easter Vigil. Would well, happen. no, he would go to yeah, the Easter Vigil. Yeah, as a parishioner, but he wouldn't go as a, as a subject of the rites. He would he, he would celebrate his reception in a full communion, everything being normal. Let's In, in pandemia, nothing's normal. But let's say in a normal world, he would usually celebrate his reception in a full communion at an ordinary time Sunday Mass. Or, or, if, or any Sunday yeah, Mass. Yeah, if, you, if he much. shows up in Lent, you could do it in Lent. Or it could be a weekday Mass if he doesn't want the, everybody there. But it's, it's, yeah. it, it, the point is, it would not be Easter Vigil. It would be a Mass, regular Mass. Yeah. And if, he's, if his story really is kind of what we described, he's probably ready long before Easter Vigil. So I, we would not make him wait yeah. for Easter Vigil and all. But again... You won't know this until you know the person's story and the person's needs and desires and how God's grace has been working in that person's life. So if you want to review the, the six steps that we talked about, the blog post link is in the, um, is in the uh, comments there and you can go take a look at that. Um, also, we're going to talk about how this this whole journey of faith thing works the vision of it in the RCA we're going to talk about it in a webinar tomorrow tomorrow and that's free yeah 
So tomorrow it happens live, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Yeah, which is 2, 2, 2 p.m. PM Eastern. And, yes, and, uh, <laughs> and all points in between. Yeah. Or if you Google, just Google time <laughs> conversion. Yes. But anyway, we're going to go much deeper into all this and how this works. Uh, and so, so join us for that. If you can't join us for that, then go look at the blog post and, uh, and review some of that. And then if you feel up to it, come up with your own example, some, some real seeker that you have, and write their story in the comments and how you would apply each of these principles to their journey of faith. How would, you, how would you do that with them as I did in those two extreme examples? Maybe you've got somebody in the middle and you can uh, put that in the comments for, for the rest of us to edify us. So, gosh, uh, seemingly simple question. Yes, right. With a very, very long answer. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. You got to break it open. There's a lot of stuff in there. But I think it's really good for us to get at, you know, what is the what is the paradigm going on in the way we ask questions and the the way we phrase our questions about our CIA mm -hmm. that reveal where we are being called to a, a different vision, a, a broader understanding of what the rights of Christian initiation of adults actually is. Yeah. So, but we are so so grateful for everything that you are doing all year long, not, ju not just in March, <laughs> not just in September. Not but, just in pandemia. Yes, but all the time. And we are uh, encouraged by your commitment to this ministry. So thank you. All right, everyone. It's lunchtime here, so we're going to go eat. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We'll see you maybe next week. Um, yeah. But hopefully tomorrow, webinar, community chat. See you there. Bye.